Good morning. morning. Welcome to Williston Presbyterian Church. Hope you have a sense of the grace and peace of this place. It is good to have you here this morning. Do take note of all the announcements in the Bolton, all the things coming up, Holy Week activities and and our our Sunday supper next week. And uh, put them on your calendars if you can attend. Um, I also would like to ask Andrea McGee to come up, who gives us our minute for mission. See, I didn't forget. No, thank you. I just want to make note of that. I noticed. (laughs) Good morning. Around the world, millions of people lack access to sustainable food sources, clean water, sanitation, education, and opportunity. Three programs are supported by the One Great Hour of Sharing offering. Presbyterian Disaster Assistance, the Presbyterian Hunger Program, and Self-Development of People. These programs work in different ways to serve individuals and communities in need. Presbyterian Disaster Assistance works alongside communities as they recover and find hope after the devastation of natural or human-caused disasters and support refugees. They receive 32% of the One Great Hour of Sharing funds. The Presbyterian Hunger Program takes action to alleviate hunger, care for creation, and address the systemic causes of poverty so that all may be fed. They receive 36% of the funds. Self-development of people invests in communities responding to their experiences of oppression, poverty, and injustice and educates Presbyterians about the impact of these issues. They receive 32% of the funds. From initial disaster response to ongoing community development, their work fits together to provide people with safety, sustenance, and hope. Received during the season of Lent, each gift to the one great hour of sharing helps to improve the lives of people in these challenging situations. The offering provides a way to share God's love with our neighbors in need and is, in fact, the single largest way that Presbyterians come together every year to work for a better world. There are informational inserts and offering envelopes in your bulletin. Coin boxes are available in the back. Checks should be made out to Williston Presbyterian Church and earmarked for OGHS so you don't have to write out one great hour of sharing. As always, thank you for your generous support. Of course, if you've already written the check and it does say one great hour sharing, we'll still take it. (laughs) I I do believe one great hour sharing is probably the oldest special offering in the history of the Presbyterian Church USA. And it's something I've always deeply believed in. Those of the areas where it's divided are very, very good causes where you can be certain that the funds you donate will go to the places in need. So... I pray you'll uh, give generously to the one great hour of sharing. Who has our special bulletin today? All right. Stand up. Our news members, introduce yourself officially. Uh, Peter and Susan Cohen from Pennsylvania. Okay, good to have you here. We, we consider you a South Carolinian. You're here enough yet. I know you're divided, you're tired, and all that kind of thing, but you know your heart. You know, nothing could be finer than to be in Carolina. I just, I just, I just, yes. just, okay, I just wanted to make that clear. Some time ago, I asked for prayers for our friend Craig, who fell off the machine. Yes, I remember. Had a bad head injury. Just a little update on him. Uh, he's, he wakes up from time to time. Mm-hmm. This is four months now he's been pretty much in a coma. But uh, things were very hopeful. Thank you. Well, let's say a word of prayer. Gracious God, we continue to pray for Craig as he um, struggles with his injury. 
we're grateful the doctor says that he eventually will um, begin to um, um, come out of his coma, comatose state and, and, uh, um, and we pray for patience as those days tick off. We're thankful for his doctors and for his nurses and healthcare workers and all who are assisting him. And may his family know your presence. This we ask in Christ's name, amen. Okay. We'll now have our choral call to worship. I knew that by heart. <laughs> Turns out I didn't. All right. Open the hymnal, Doug. <laughs> uh, I'll ask you to rise if you're able to uh, join in our call to worship. Let us join our voices with the saints whose lives inspire. We are ready to worship and give thanks for whose we are. In our worship, you share God's message with the world. Let us worship God. If we, are, if we confess our sins, our God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. As God's people gather together, let us now pray our prayer of confession. Let us pray. O Lord, 
Please hear our prayer as we start climb down the mountain with Jesus. After these 40 days and 40 nights, we pray that we will be ready for what comes next. As the ministry of Jesus began after a season of prayer, so does ours. Give thanks for the promise you will be with us as we continue to spread the gospel to the world. May your will be done through us on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ came into this world to save sinners. Sinners just like me and sinners just like you. He personally bore with his body on the cross our sin so that we might be dead to sin and alive to all that's fresh and new. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. be seated. Well, I'd like to wish you all a happy St. Patty's Day. I hope you all wore green or orange. <coughs> I tried to find a green and orange tie, but they just didn't seem to go well together. So I chose green. Today I'm going to talk to you, though, not about Ireland, but about 30 miles, if you go the other way, to Ayrshire in Scotland. Uh, you know, the, the, the language of both Ireland and Scotland at its root is Celtic. And the word in Celtic for mountain is Bray. You can read that with Robbie Bird's poetry all the time. A Bray. Well, there's a mountain in Ayrshire, which is right on the coast facing Ireland, called the Electric Bray. And it's famous. And the reason why is when you come to it, it looks like it's going uphill. But if you put your car in neutral, remarkably, the car goes up the hill. Define physics. Define anything you can think of. And, and for years, folks have wondered how this could be. Is there some kind of electrical magnet there drawing you, or some kind of magical thing drawing you up, uh, making you go uphill when you're not supposed to? I haven't watched a video of it earlier this week. Well, scientists came, and they studied it, and surveyors studied it, and they determined it's an optical illusion. You may think you're going uphill, but you're really not. You're actually going downhill. So you think, when you put your car in neutral, that it's magically going uphill, but no, it's really doing what it's supposed to do, going downhill. And I wonder in our lives, if we think that we're in our lives, the decisions we make, whether we're going the right direction or not, or whether we think we're going uphill, when we're really going downhill. I always like a sermon illustration, you know how folks, you know, they, they go up and up and up, thinking it's the ladder of success, they sacrifice, they keep going up and up and up, and they finally get to the top and they realize they're on the wrong building. <laughs> Well, it's a good thing in Lent to think about the direction of life you're going and not to be fooled with an optical illusion as you live your life, to contend with the direction you're actually going. That's a good thing to think about in Lent for both me and you, even on this St. Patrick's Day. Thank you.
Amen. Please be seated. We now come to our time of prayer, and I'd like to ask you if you have any prayer requests. Yes. Uh-huh. What's his first name again? Yes, you had one. A double dose right there. Here we go. Are there any others? Yes. What are their names again? Judy and Walter. Judy and Walter. Thank you. And Carolyn Nelke is in the hospital. Okay. I read that. Anything else? Okay, let us go to God in prayer. Oh God. As we come before you in your throne of grace this morning on this Sunday in Lent, deliver us, we pray, from smug assumptions which hide the eternal depths of mystery from us and encounter us as we go through our daily lives and even in this hour. Oh God, if ever you become commonplace, in our hearts, in our minds, taking away your power and the fire of your holiness. If our lives seem so smoothed out and it's pain and suffering and difficulty ignored, dear Lord, if the great hunger of our souls becomes muted and silenced in what could only be petty rituals of self-satisfaction, then speak to us and in your righteousness make plain the deceit and arrogance of such thoughts. We pray you'd always, in those times, to turn us again to the cross in which we may see the heights and the depths of this world's suffering and pain. Oh God, teach us to stand bravely in the midst of the cross's mystery until we receive the benefit the benediction of your redeeming grace. O oh God, we pray that all those that we've mentioned today will come to know of your redeeming grace and your love. And so we pray for Nicholas, who's getting a new kidney. We're thankful for the miracle of medicine and all it can do for us. We pray you be with Judy and Walter, who are having issues with assisted living. Help them and guide them. We lift before your throne of grace our own Carolyn Nolte and be with her and may she know your presence while you're in the hospital. Oh God, we always come to worship to glorify you and also to renew our faith, uh, to find the energy to be your disciple as we go from this place into our daily lives in the world. So we pray you'll enable us to do that. Help us to leave this place energized, renewed, and restored and ready to meet the demands that are set before our lives. 
We ask all these things in Christ's name. And remember the prayer he taught us when he prayed. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts. Forgive our debtors and lead us not to temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Today's text is one that has sort of a special place in my heart. When I was a young junior at seminary, our preaching professor, Dr. Tom Long, assigned this very passage for all of us new students to be our first sermon that we would be delivering before the professor himself. Back then, I thought I wrote a sermon by the master. Now, I'd give myself probably a D, or at best a gentleman's C. It's a great text. But before we turn to it and to the sermon, let us turn to God in prayer. Eternal God, we pray your spirit would descend upon this place with power and your word be delivered with full assurance through the Holy Spirit in the strong name of Jesus Christ. Our text today comes from the 12th chapter of John's Gospel, the 20th through the 33rd verses. Let us now reverently attend to the reading of God's holy word as I take this from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival, Passover, were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethesda in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it. And those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now is my soul troubled. And what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. It is the reason, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there said that it was thunder. Others said an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler will be driven out, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Often people ask me how I put my sermons together. Back in the old days, when I had a manuscript, it was obvious. I sat down and I typed it and put it together. Then tried to memorize it and preach it from a manuscript. It's become more prominent, though, when I do this and I don't have a manuscript anymore. They wonder how I put them together. Well, let me give you an inkling of how I do it this week. It's usually many times, it's after Jean goes to bed. And earlier this week, I went on the computer, did a search on the most important things in the history of the world and how it was listed. Had all sorts of stuff come up. Talked about the 
of course, the printing press by Gutenberg. Talked about the American Revolution and the shot heard around the world. The Russian Revolution. World War I, where a generation basically perished. World War II. On and on. In one of them, a Time magazine won several years ago, uh, Jesus was ranked third. You know who was two? Paul. Tom's reasoning was that our view of Jesus was shaped by Paul in the epistles. Don't agree with that, but it's an interesting take. But not once, not once in all my online search was the crucifixion of Jesus Christ listed as one of the most important things that happened in the history of the world. And I searched for a good hour and a half. There. I know somewhat of what I do sometimes. I did find one resource. A great preacher of a generation ago, David H.C. Reed, who was a prisoner of war in World War II and went on to fulfill the Madison Avenue Presbyterian Church. Uh, I believe at that time it had 6,000 members. Talked about a group of 30 scholars that was brought together in the 1950s. I couldn't find it in my search. And the cross of Christ finished 14th amongst those 30. I suppose people were looking more for political things than for spiritual things. But that's not true for me. And I don't think it's true for preachers. The very first sermon in Pentecost that Peter preached after he has that moving explanation that Jesus was the Messiah, the hope for one, the Son of God, Peter turns to the crowd and says, and you killed him. Paul, standing up to the intellectuals at the time and to the, and to the, to the synagogue that was trying to undermine him, said, we preach Christ crucified. A stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. I have to say I believe we preachers return to the cross again and again and again. In over 35 years of ministry, and very few times in the week I haven't thought about it and consider it because it is the great ineffable mystery of our faith. That the Son of God, the eternal God, omnipotent, all-powerful, eternal, would die on a cross, would die. This passage has to do with this. Oh, it's so easy you can preach good sermons on rabbit holes. You can go down, we wish to see Jesus. You know, back in the 1950s, that was a big deal. It started with the first Presbyterian church in Dallas. They put a great big bronze thing in their pulpit saying, Sir, we would wish to see Jesus. That the preacher had to contend with every week. And that became commonplace. The trouble with it, though, is it's not right in the Greek. It's not about seeing Jesus, just looking at him and saying, Hi, Jesus, I'm, I'm Doug. Nice to meet you. In the koina, it's far deeper than that. It's almost, it's my sermon title. It's not just seeing Jesus, looking at what he looks like, wanting to meet him, or asking for his autograph. It's perceiving Jesus. We want to know Jesus. We want to understand Jesus. That's a lot deeper than just seeing, isn't it? We want to really know who he is. And Christ's answer is basically, if you know me, you've got to understand 
what I'm about to do when he's lifted up and will draw all people to himself. And John powerfully writes, in saying this, he was showing the way he is about to die. So once again, we come to the cross. You know, when you come to it, you always got to ask the question, at least I do, over and over again, why? Why did Jesus have to do that? Why did he answer that way? Now, I suppose that you can think it was just fate. That Jesus was just fated to come to the cross. It couldn't help it. You know, that's what kismet, that's what fate is. Over Kayam, that's his philosophy. The, the, the mover writes, and as he writes, not a word, neither wit nor piety can be changed. Even if you shed all the tears, not a word shall be removed. That's kismet. That's fate. Now I want to make sure that you understand that the working of God in our lives and blind fate are two different things. And when I look from the moment when Jesus says he sets his face to go to Jerusalem until we come to the cross itself, there's all sorts of men and people and women making decisions out of their free will. Judas could have not taken the bribe. Pilate could have decided not to offer Barabbas as an alternative to Jesus. The Pharisees could have chosen not to be illegal and, and, and have a trial by night. They could have chosen to listen to Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea on the Sanhedrin. And Jesus, Jesus, he could have chosen not to stop in the Garden of Gethsemane and pray that prayer that's so akin to our text today. He could have chosen to march right past the Mount of Olives and back to the safety of Galilee. And the prayer he prays in today's text, no even though my heart is troubled. No, it is for this very time, for this very hour that you have sent me. Those prayers, both in today's and at the Garden of Gethsemane, where he prays that if possible, this cup may be passed from him. If you believe in fate, blind fate, well, then those prayers are a mockery. Oh, we could say that the cross is just the, just the, the bringing together of unforeseen circumstances and the folly of others. And history is often like that. Unforeseen circumstances and the folly of others. Who would have ever thought in 1914 that the killing of an obscure Austri Austrian archduke would lead to the annihilation of hundreds of thousands of people in World War I? Unforeseen circumstance, you got that right. Folly of others. 
as treaty after stupid treaty they decide to follow, <laughs> we'll go to World War II. Winston Churchill argues quite eloquently that World War II was just an accident made up of the, brought about by the folly of others. That if the leaders of the 1930s had enough guts and courage and, and they actually forced Germany to, uh, to, to, uh, uh, to stay with the Treaty of Verdun, or the, excuse me, the Treaty of Versailles, it wouldn't have happened. If they could have had any kind of gumption at all, and if they had just had stood up to Adolf Hitler, it never would have happened. The folly of Neville Chamberlain of always just acquiescing and moving the ball. History could have been so far different. You can make the same argument with the last week. Who would have thought if you took a poll of the people in Jerusalem who wanted to see Jesus crucified, you think that would have been the majority of people in Jerusalem? Absolutely not. But it happens. Do you think the Pharisees at the beginning of the week wanted to give such a violent death to Jesus at the start of the week? Do you think it was their plan to use crucifixion to kill him? The most gory, worst, violent death that you can go through? You think that was their plan at the start of the week? Do you think, you think the Sadducees really wanted to do that too? They just, they just wanted to keep their economy in the temple course. They just wanted to keep the peace with Rome. You think Pontius Pilate really wanted to do that? It was all a bunch of stupid decisions. All a bunch of unforeseen circumstances, you could argue, that come together all at the same time. You can argue that if you want, but I think it's wrong. To argue that way, the idea that when Jesus sets his feast to go to Jerusalem, and it seems like every decision he makes is with purpose, it's with forethought, it's with clarity, not, not just happenstance, every decision he makes brings him closer and closer to what's about to happen. If you're going to say it's just unforeseen circumstance that the cross happens, if it just has to do with the folly of humanity is why it happens, then you have to say that Jesus Christ was just the unfortunate person in the hands of the uncertainty of the world. You want to argue that? Why? Why the cross? Well, this text answers it. For this purpose I have come. It wasn't fate. It wasn't just unforeseen circumstance. It wasn't just the unfortunate folly of other human beings. Jesus Christ came to come to the cross. He came to die. It was a choice. He could have gone to Galilee. He, but he chose not to. It was a choice. We know about that kind of sacrificial choice. I reread it this week about Michael Mansour in Iraq, who when he saw 
a bomb come into the half track, made a choice, and decided to, rather than jump out of the half track, because he saw it, he laid on top of the bomb and died, saving his others, his friends. That was a choice. Jesus made a choice. But still the question is why? And it becomes clear in the whole story of his life, in the totality of the gospel story, it becomes clear that God decides that if he's going to deliver a message of forgiveness, if he's going to do that, the God of power and peace and joy makes a decision that if he's going to alleviate the suffering of humanity, he has to come to humanity and suffer himself for us so that we could understand finally what the great powerful God, how he loves us. It's like Soren Kierkegaard's great parable, The King and the Humble Maiden. He tries to think all the ways that he could tell the humble maiden that he loves her. He's going to pretend to be, a, pretend to be just a, a poor person, to uh, just brash in as the king. And he decides the only way he could truly show that he loves her is to actually become poor for her sake so she'd believe him. It's not the inevitability of fate, dear friends at Williston. It's not about the uncertainty of history and the folly and decisions of others. The cross is inevitable and the reason why it's because it's an inevitability of love. He chose to do that because he loves you. And he loves me. That's why. The cross, all that other stuff, all those other great things that happened in the history of the world, the cross is the most wonderful thing, the most important thing that has happened. Because it's the cross that brings about Easter. And it's the cross that proclaims what God thinks about us. God in Jesus Christ has taken the initiative. That's very Presbyterian. It's always God who takes the initiative for us. It's always God who reaches out for us. But the cross, when you come near to it, brings us to how Billy Graham put it, to the hour of decision. The most important hour of decision in your life. Oh, the hymn writers got it right. In the cross of Christ I glory, towering over all the wrecks of time. Forbid it, Lord, Isaac Watt says, that I should boast, save in the death of thy dear son, all the things that charm me most. I sacrifice them to his blood. <coughs> Jesus Christ made a choice. And this connects me to the electric bray as you consider the direction of your life this Lent. So you too must make a choice. And it's not a choice about fate or about circumstance. It's a choice before the cross of Jesus Christ. Will you follow? Will you follow? You see, 
I've been quoting songs. I like what George Beverly Shea sings. I'd rather have Jesus than men's applause. I'd rather be faithful to his dear cause. That is a choice. In front of the choices made by Almighty God and Jesus Christ on the cross. The hour decision is now with us. Amen. Let us rise and reaffirm what we believe. I believe in God the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He descended into hell, and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Will the ushers please come forward?
us pray. Eternal and loving God, we are thankful for these gifts so generously given. We pray for your church and the upbuilding of your kingdom. Make us stewards, O oh God, of your house. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Now to the only God, be all glory and power, dominion and majesty, this day and forevermore. Amen.